Hello everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Today in this chapter we are going to talk about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So in previous uh, lectures we have talked about that Y that we have in our, um, that we called a real GDP. We, we said Y was equal to C plus I plus G plus NX where we said that C is consumption, I is investment, G is government spending, and NX is net export, which is basically x minus m. So we talked that this is GDP. We also mentioned that GDP equals to a times a function of KLHN, where we said a is technology, f is a mathematical function, k is capital, h is human capital, l is labor or the number of workers, and and N is natural resources. Now we may have a question is that why is there two different equations for GDP? So this is one equation and this is the other equation. In this chapter, we're going to see where do these come from? So this GDP that we have on this side, this is the production of GDP. So imagine we are producing GDP here. So we are using capital, labor, human capital and natural resources and the level of technology to produce a certain level of output. This GDP we have, this is the consumption side. So this consumption is telling us how are we using the GDP. So why is our real GDP or our income for the economy? We either consume it, we either invest part of it, we have some level of government spending or taxes that we um, give to the government, and then we also maybe sell some abroad or we buy stuff from abroad. So we have net exports. Now the consumption side, as it, the name kind of suggests, it's basically the aggregate demand side. Whereas the production side is dealing with aggregate supply. Since we are not looking at one market, but the total economy, that's why we call it aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So first let's look at aggregate demand. Now, if you remember from demand curve that we had before, we talked about the demand curve and we had price and quantity, and the demand curve was downward sloping like that. In our case right now, when we look at aggregate demand, we're going to call it, instead of D, we will call it AD, aggregate demand. And instead of quantity, this will be the total output, so it's Y the price remains at P. So now this is my aggregate demand curve and it is downward sloping. So one thing we have to figure out is why is aggregate demand curve downward sloping? What makes it downward sloping? So as we know, this is aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is basically equals to, which is Y equals to C plus I plus G plus NX. So since my y-axis is price, we have to see what happens if price increases or if price decreases. If price increases, what aggregate demand is saying is that y should decrease or vice versa. If price decreases, y should increase. Now one thing we have to show is that, okay, y will only decrease for sure if price increases and C decreases, I decreases, G decreases, and also net exports decrease. So if an, an increase in price can makes all these different components of aggregate demand decrease, then we can say for sure that Y will also decrease. So let's look at an example. What happens if aggregate demand or if price goes up or down. So let's say, just for simplicity, let's imagine that my Y is 100, and let's say the price level was $2. So with that price, and again, this is my first scenario initially. So in that case, let's say my consumption is, I spent $60 on consumption. Let's say investment is, um, $25 and then government is another $35. So then if you notice 60 plus 25 plus 35 becomes 120. So my 
net export is negative 20. So then if I add them all together, I should get 100. Now let's say my price, instead of $2, it has fallen to a dollar. So if price has fallen, what will happen to consumption? Well, what I can see is initially, I spent $60 on consumption. So basically what I did is, if price was $2, I basically consumed 60 divided by two, which is 30 units of goods. However, if price falls to a dollar, I can now consume, so this was initially, now I can consume 60 units. So if price goes up, or, or sorry, in my case, if price goes down, I can actually consume a lot more. And I don't even have to keep, you know, the same consumption, out of, like expenditure, I can actually reduce it. Maybe I can even reduce it to $50, but I would still consume 50 units. So as price goes down, the real amount I consume, since Y is real GDP, goes up. Even though I may be spending less, but in real terms, I am consuming more. So what we will see here is, as we go up here, as price increases, or let's say price decreases, my consumption level, real consumption, increases. So then we can see that this remains true, so which is good. Now let's look at investment. What happens to investment if price decreases? So if price decreases, as we can see that, I don't need to spend as much to get more units of goods. So I could save even more. If price decreases, I could spend $50 on consumption and maybe I could save $5 and maybe for $5 goes to maybe G or NX that I haven't decided yet, but I could save five extra dollars. So if I save more, my investment then, because savings equals investment in an economy for the most part, so investment goes from 25 to 30. And as a result of that, I can see that if price goes down, if price decreases, the amount of savings could go up. So if savings goes up, if there's more savings, we can see that interest rates could go down because there's much more, a bigger pool to provide to investors. And as a result, if interest rates go down, investment goes up. So consequently, we will see that in our case, this inverse relationship remains. So what we saw is if price goes down, investment goes up, or if price goes up, investment goes down. What about with government? Let's say if you have more consumption, and in some books they actually hold it as constant. Let's say government remains constant, and then what happens to others? But let's say, I mean, in our case, what happens if government is actually there. If price decreases, does government spending increase? So what happens is, let's say if price decreases, we may see that goods are cheaper. So with the same tax collection, level of government expenditure or real government expenditure can increase. So as price decreases, it implies that government expenditure can go up. Or if price increases, we see that government expenditure goes down. So this one also is fulfilled. Next, we have net exports, okay? So if price decreases, let's say, what happens to next exports, which is X minus M. So a price decrease means domestic prices are falling, which means that price of exports, because exports are domestically produced goods, those are falling, which means that my level of export will go up. People will find my exports to be more competitive, so they will buy my exports, or people abroad will buy my exports more. Um, people in the local economy may find imports, if price of exports or local goods are falling, imports may become more expensive. So level of imports may decrease. As a result, net exports will go up. So then we see that if price decreases, net exports go up. 
or if price increases, net exports go down. So then this is also fulfilled. Therefore, we can say that after all these, we can now show that my price and Y, I have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Now, what factors affect this ag aggregate demand curve? What factors shifts ag aggregate demand curve to the right or left? And it's pretty easy. It is basically change in consumption. So if consumption increases, aggregate demand goes up. If consumption decreases, aggregate demand goes down. So each of the components of aggregate demand can shift it to the left or right. So that goes with aggregate demand. Now what about aggregate supply? So we have this curve. We know that aggregate supply, as we said, it is a function of the level of technology times F of the level of capital, labor, human capital, and natural resources. So we have these factors that affect output or our production. Now, what we have here is aggregate supply being Y and price. We have two different kinds of aggregate supply. The first one is what we call, which is a vertical line, and we call this long run aggregate supply or LRAS. Now, why is this called long run? Well, in the long run, we believe that the, given the level of technology, given the level of capital, labor, human capital, and natural resources, we can only utilize all these inputs up to a certain level. So this vertical line is independent of the price. So no matter what the price is, this is the maximum we can produce. So let's call it Y star. Another easy way of thinking is Y star is where the natural rate of unemployment is. So Y star, this is the maximum level of output we can produce given the resources we have right now. And it is where we have our, we have reached our natural rate of unemployment or the lowest level of unemployment that the economy can achieve. Now get this is in the long run. This is what we have in the long run. Now we know that this is not true for the short run. The short run is where we are living from quarter to quarter or from year to year. There could be a lot of different economic fluctuations. There could be social unrest, there could be economic unrest, maybe price of oil is going up, that affects our production. Maybe um, global pandemics happen, that affects our production. So we may have all these factors, but they may not be utilized appropriately, or they may be overutilized. So on the other hand, instead of long run, we also have another supply curve. So I'll just write this as LRAS. We also have something called a short run aggregate supply. Imagine it's something like this. So let's say you're studying for finals or you're in the semester and you know you will basically study at, let's say three to four hours a week. That's your that's what you study every week. But during finals, you probably will up your hours of studying. You will probably go to 10 to 12 hours of studying per week. Now you can do this for short periods of time, but maybe not for extended periods of time. So in during extended periods of time, this becomes impossible. And so which what you may do is that after finals are over, you go back to your regular study schedule. So short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply are similar to that. This is what our future potential is. So this is based on maybe workers working 40 hour a week, maybe capital being used appropriately with a certain level of depreciation every year. Maybe we have a certain level of human capital, maybe certain level of natural resources. And so all these are affecting, or, or these are determining the natural or the long run aggregate supply. However, there may be cases where I may have to, maybe uh, I suddenly got a lot of demand. Let's say it's uh, during Christmas. So I will ask my workers to work overtime. So that may then increase my supply curve. So in the short run, I may move up here, but 
or I may actually find, or maybe I can bring in people from abroad to work for short periods of time, and that may increase my human capital and I produce more, so I'm here. But then this kind of intensive work is not sustainable in the long run. So what happens is I either move back down to the long run or I move laterally to the long run right here. So this is where the long run aggregate supply is where the economy is usually at equilibrium. The short run is deviation from this long run equilibrium. Now here we showed going up, it could also go down. Maybe there is um, a natural disaster that reduced our ability to produce. So maybe it destroyed some of the roads and networks. So factories may, um, may produce, but at a lower level, or maybe the machinery is there, but workers are there, everything is there, but because the road network has been damaged, they cannot sell their goods on time. It could cause our aggregate supply or short-run aggregate supply to fall down here. But then eventually once things get back to normal, we go back up to either the long-run aggregate supply, which is here, or we may go laterally to that. So short-run, we could produce more or produce less than our full potential. But in the long run, we technically go back to our to our long run aggregate supply. The other thing to notice is the classical dichotomy here is that we say that price does not affect long run production or long run aggregate supply. So no matter what the price is, it doesn't really matter how much you're producing or, or no matter what the price is, you don't really update your production in the long run. But in the short run, if prices go up, sellers may think they may make more money, so they may want to produce more. If prices go down, sellers think they make less money, so they may produce less. But eventually, they will find out that these price changes are not really, if maybe they're not being part of anything important, so they go back to the natural or the long run aggregate supply levels. Now, what factors affect aggregate demand and aggregate supply? Now, what factors shift the long run aggregate supply? The ones that are in the equation already are the ones that affect aggregate supply. So any changes in the level of technology, if we have any changes in capital, changes in the number of workers, changes in human capital, and changes in natural resources. So if any of these factors increase, we will see long run aggregate supply shift to the right. And that happens sometimes, you know, when we are innovating, we're producing more technology, we see aggregate supply shift to the right. If we have more capital, we, are we can produce more in the long run. If we get more workers, we can produce more. If the workers are educated or more educated, are more skilled, we are able to produce more. Same with natural resources. If we suddenly find that we have new minerals in our, uh, in our soil or we find that we have other resources that we previously did not harness, then our aggregate supply shifts to the right. Conversely, if any of these falls, aggregate supply will shift to the left. Now let's look at aggregate supply or short-run aggregate supply. Now, what factors could shift the aggregate supply to the left or right? One of the things is cost of these materials. So if interest rates go up, we should see aggregate supply shift to the left. If interest rates go down, then we could expect the aggregate supply or short-run aggregate supply to shift to the right. Same thing with wages, same thing with maybe cost of getting higher education and maybe getting more natural resources, either cheaply or expensive, or if it gets more expensive. So things like that could affect my short run aggregate supply. So let's write this down here. Short run aggregate supply, things that could affect it are changes in cost. So cost of production. Other thing that affects short run aggregate supply is probably like something like weather. If weather is good, we may see a higher agriculture output or maybe more production. 
or more people going to beaches and spending money in services. So we would see shark on aggregate supply shift to the right. If weather is very bad, we may see like people staying indoors, not going out, not spending more money, not buying more oil to drive their cars. So we may see aggregate supply or short run aggregate supply to shift to the left. So this is basically what we have with short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply. Now let's bring these two aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves together and let's see how they affect the economy. So here we have the three curves. We have our aggregate demand, we have our short run aggregate supply, and we have our long run aggregate supply. The intersection is at this point, which we will call P star. So at this point, the economy is at equilibrium. So at P star and Y star, economy is at equilibrium. So at these two price points, everything is fine. Now let's say, let's look at a situation. So we said cost of production is something that affects short run aggregate supply. Let's say that we use an example where maybe cost went up. So maybe price of fuels went up. So as we know that if cost of fuel went up, maybe cost of production went up. So we would expect aggregate supply, the short run, to shift or change. The long run potential that we can produce does not change. So consequently, what we would see is the aggregate supply curve to shift to the left to maybe somewhere here. Consequently, we will see that the new place where the intersection of short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand is here. We see price go up to P star star. So things are more expensive and output has actually fallen. We're producing less and we're producing below our potential. So this point where prices are increasing and quantity is falling, this has a special name, it's called stagflation. So I'll call this point R. Point R is known as stagflation. This is a situation where we are seeing rising prices but falling output. So now what will happen if we are here? Well, two things can happen. Well, governments don't like this. So what a government could do is either reduce supply or sorry, not reduce supply, either in, well, governments could either increase supply, short run aggregate supply down here, or governments could just try to find ways to increase aggregate demand. So we could increase aggregate demand up till the point and how can we do that? We could probably provide incentives to increase consumption or increase investment or maybe do more government spending. And then what will happen is our aggregate demand curve then shifts to the right to AD prime and then we are up here. So we end up going back to our original long run production level. But what ends up happening is the price has gone up even further to P star star star. So we can see then if we are already having stagflation and government uses demand side to increase our production, we end up with even higher prices. And higher prices here means more inflation. Now the other way we could reduce um, our prices and also reduce our or increase our production is by instead of increasing aggregate demand, we could just say that we want to reduce aggregate supply. So I'm going to just draw the lines here. So one way of doing it, we, we could say that instead of increasing aggregate demand, we want to increase aggregate supply. So how do we do that then? Well, oil prices went up as we saw, or cost of fuel went up. Well, we could increase A, or we could spend more to increase A, or we could increase K. Now, if we try to increase these, what will happen is long run aggregate supply then, as we said, those are the factors affecting long run. This will then shift to the right. 
So if that shifts to the right, we move somewhere here, we increase our economic potential, we are down here, then, so what could be another way that we increase our short-run aggregate supply? We could find ways to reduce cost of production. And if we reduce cost of production, or maybe we have favorable, hopefully we have favorable weather, or we are somehow able to increase output, then we can shift our short-run aggregate supply back to this original output or equilibrium. Now let's look at another case. And what about if we see changes in, what if government takes position, let's say that causes consumption to go up. So maybe people are spending more money, they're optimistic about the economy. So if consumption goes up, we know aggregate demand shifts to the right. This was the original equilibrium. Now we are here. So as aggregate demand goes up, people see that, or producers see that there's higher demand in the economy. So initially, let's say the price level at this pre-star, they think that, okay, we can use our machinery even more. We can make workers work longer hours, and that will cause people to basically work, produce more goods and services. But what it does is it increases price, and we are now producing more than what our output potential is. We cannot do this for long periods of time unless we find ways. Maybe we, as we are producing more, that's when governments can say, maybe we need to increase our technology, or maybe we need to spend more on investment so that, or maybe we need to provide more incentive to um, entrepreneurs so that they invest more or maybe we need human capital to go up, or we need more workers to enter the economy. If those happen, then what we can do is shift the long run aggregate supply curve to the right, to right there. So now we are producing, now this becomes the new equilibrium. Now, yes, price did increase, but we are also producing more. So this is a good outcome. However, maybe if governments are not able to produce more, then what happens is we need to go back to this long run aggregate supply. So one way of either doing this is if we are down here, this is unsustainable. So governments could increase taxes. To reduce aggregate supply or to reduce aggregate demand down to here or what else will happen is after a while when workers figure out that they're working longer hours so now they need more pay um, if machines are being used more intensively they may break down they may depreciate faster so they need to be replaced so as a result of that short-run aggregate supply may decrease because cost goes up, so it shifts to the left. And now the new equilibrium is we're still producing at Y star, but we are producing at a higher price point. So the best outcome then, as we can see for an economy, this is what, so the best outcome for governments to have, or what governments try to do, is they try to provide incentives so that investment and consumption grows so that mine aggregate demand curve shifts to the right. And so as prices go up, this is the slight inflation that we see every year, about 2% inflation. That's what the Federal Reserve tries to maintain. Now, some years it's a lot higher, some years maybe it's lower, but they try to increase our aggregate demand slightly. This then, uh, producers see this increasing and they may then be interested to produce more goods and services so they may invest in technology so technology may go up they may produce or get more capital for more production they may try to train their workers even more which then leads to an increase in long-run aggregate supply and now we are at a new equilibrium so the price hasn't risen any further we are here but we now are producing at a higher level. 
So every year, whenever we say we have real economy and growth, we are moving slowly more to the right. If there is a recession or shrinking of the economy, we may lose some of our resources, so we may actually shift more to the left. So then this way we are at this level. Now next year, maybe the government may try to increase aggregate demand even more. That increase in aggregate demand then spurs maybe a slight increase in aggregate, uh, long run aggregate supply. However, there are cases, maybe we are hit with a hurricane or maybe we have adverse weather condition or maybe different global events that could affect our um, production ability. So we may see short run aggregate supply inadvertently shift to the left or right. If that happens, the, that's a short term thing, it does lead to increases or decreases in prices. So then the government, they can use either fiscal measures by changing aggregate demand, they could affect our economy and move it back to this equilibrium where all three intersect, all three lines intersect at one point, or they could try to either increase short run aggregate supply or decrease short run aggregate supply so that we move back to that equilibrium. Hopefully this was helpful. I hope this helped you understand aggregate demand and aggregate supply. I will see you at a later video. Have a good day. Goodbye.